Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. So greetings and welcome, Denise. I've been really looking forward to our conversation. Thanks for having me. Well, the first thing I like to do with all of my guests is to learn a bit more about uh, about the guests. So I like to learn uh, your origin story. Um, I imagine you have quite an interesting one. And was it was it inevitable that you'd kind of end up where you are today? So it'd be good to know what you studied at university and then what your first job was and what was your path to to where you are now. <laughs> Well, would you believe I majored in biology and nutrition? Um, okay. But it's actually germane because it was sort of about like, how are we who we are? Yeah. Like that's the common thread. Um, but then I went to work for IBM because like having a corporate job where you sold computers and they paid you, you know, and these big commission checks seemed kind of cool. And so I started doing that. I, I literally thought I would do that. And I was, then I was supposed to go to Stanford and get my MBA. And I was like, I was 27. And I think I thought, oh my God, if I wake up when I'm 40 and I have to sell somebody a computer, I'm literally going to like slit my wrist. Like who cares? And so I had actually gotten myself into therapy because I thought it sounded interesting. And I thought, you know, that'd be interesting to be a psychologist. So I finagled my life. I quit IBM and went to Aspen for the winter finagled my life into Chicago and got into this graduate program at the University of Chicago. It's like a design your own, do whatever you want. And so I did, following on the biology, what was called biopsychology. In other words, like, how does our brain create our perception? How does our brain create our self-image? Like, where does it come from? Like, how do we have a personality that's consistent? Like, it has to be neurochemicals somehow. At least that's what I said. People thought I was crazy. (laughs) Anyway, I had been dating a former floor trader from the SIBO, the options exchange. And he had told me that he thought I would be a good trader and like that I should buy a seat on the Chicago Board of Trade. They had this weather future seat. And I was like, what on earth are you talking about? (laughs) Like weather future seat and wave my hands in colored jackets. I don't think I'm doing that. But then as I was writing my master's thesis, he got invited to go upstairs, one of the first upstairs trading firms. And so somehow I got swept along with that and ditched the PhD and became a trader and traded in prop firms and moved to New York to run my own desk. And yeah, and then all the biopsychology, which by that time was neuropsychoanalysis, started to come back into the, the psychology of of trading and investing. So presumably and, while you were trading, it became apparent to you that understanding psychology was important or how that was influencing you. I mean, it was, because well, you here's the funny thing. trading, so you, you could have just stayed in trading and, you know, just worked at a, a fund and carried on happily in trading, you know, for the rest of your career. I mean, there's two things. If I'd known there was such a thing as a hedge fund, which I didn't know, but okay. had I known... I think I would have set out to start my own, but I literally didn't know. Uh Um, I did sit next to Dimitri Baliazny, who obviously clearly came to know. um, And whether he knew at that time or not, I don't know. But um, yeah, I, you know, it was all like, what's your process, right? What's your trading plan? Like create your process, create your trading plan, follow your process, follow your plan. So I was being told that it was supposed to be this linear, systematic thing, except I would notice that the people who were making the most money weren't necessarily doing the linear, systematic thing. <laughs> okay. You know, and I was reading all the books that there were to read, Market Wizards and, you know, Mark Douglas's books and, and Ari Keeb's books, Ari Keeb's books. And I was even hiring them. I hired Keeb a little bit. I hired Douglas a little bit. But I... I had the view that everyone else has, that it's like thinking and then following your process. So it's thinking and behavior and feelings and emotions are supposed to have nothing to do with it. And then I discovered when someone wanted to publish my master's thesis, it's like as a complete flu, got a, you know, left field. And I said, look, it's got to be updated. It's neuroscience and it's a decade old. And so when I updated it, there was starting to be research showing that we can't make any decision without emotion. 
And I was like, wait, what? Like, if we can't make any decision without emotion, meaning if we didn't have emotion, we couldn't make a decision, which is what the original science showed. People who were devoid of emotion couldn't decide what day to make a doctor appointment on. They couldn't decide what shirt to wear in the morning. I was like, this changes everything. Like, and I literally was just talking to someone about it. And then they asked me to write an article. <laughs> it was the craziest thing. And then I wrote the article, and which I had wanted to be a journalist at one point, and my mother had talked me out of it. So I thought like writing an article in a magazine would be like really cool, and that would be that. That would be that. Yeah. And someone asked me to come talk about it. And then someone else. And here we are basically 20 years later. Mm -hmm. When you want me to talk about it? It like, took okay. on a life of its own. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it clearly shows that this was a part of your journey. I mean, you were thinking a lot about well, let's get meta, you're thinking about thinking, you know, along the way. Yes. I mean, not, not everybody thinks in totally. those ways. I mean, people, some people would have just said, okay, I'm going to stick to the process and I'm not going to stick my head up and look around and see what other people are doing. So there was something within you to, to yeah. look kind of a step above. I, I, I know this sounds something, but like I honestly now think I was meant to do this in this yeah. position and literally like my whole entire life has brought me into this position that I was interested in perception and judgment, that I was interested in emotion, that I was interested in the human unconscious. Like, why do we really do what we do? Mm. You know, and then I became this trader and had this experience in the markets. And then the two came back together because all of those things, perception and judgment, emotion, confidence, conviction, we can just start with those emotions. And the fact that a lot of it's unconscious all are like absolutely germane to success in the market. Yeah. And so I just happen to have these strands of things. That... <laughs> and and your, your, your master's thesis was the neurobiology of Freud's repetition compulsion. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> I read what, that. What, 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 is, what, what was Freud's repetition compulsion? What does, what does that mean? Yes, there's this great uh, paragraph that I'm not going to be able to quote exactly, but it's, so, it's something like, all of a man's relationships, no matter how differently they start, end the same way. All of a man's situations, no matter how, you know, positive they look at the beginning, have the same conclusion. And he, he basically identified that people have this tendency, which he believed was a compulsion, to get themselves in repetitive circumstance. Okay. And I noticed me and my friends doing that in our dating relationships. Yeah. Like, and I was like, I think there's something to this. So I wanted to know, like, there has to be a, t if we do that, there has to be a template of some sort, right? Like yeah. we have to be unconsciously reacting according to sort of some pre-programmed thing. Because how else could it happen? Yeah. I mean, this was my thought in 1995 at the University of Chicago. And so I'm like, well, what is it? Like, how could that be? Like, how, what would happen in the human brain that it will allow us to, you know, date two completely different guys with completely different personalities yeah. and basically have the relationship take the same course and end in the same way? Like, yeah, first of all, the, the individual's doing something to make that happen, right? Yeah. But how could they be doing it in a way that's repetitive? That's what I wanted to know. That's that's literally what that master's thesis was about. Yeah, yeah. But it rings I true. I mean, it sounds like that's that's a story of our lives in some ways, where we're in this uh, constant repetitive, uh, you know, psychodrama with whatever you know our relationships. It could be with our work. It could be with ourselves. And in in some ways, when you interact with uh, another person or some institutional entity, in some ways, it's simply a mirror onto yourself. It's, it's really just telling you about yourself rather than the other. Yeah. I mean, as it turns out, um, we develop like our view of who we are in the world and like where we fit and what we should expect to get when we're really little. Yeah. And we develop that core self-image, right? By how we're treated by the people around us when we're really little, like yeah. one, two, three, four. It also turns out there's a, a well-known phenomenon in biology called critical period. Okay. And so like 
critical period is easiest to understand in birds. If a bird does not hear its song during like a certain few weeks of development, the bird can never sing its song. Mm. That's critical period. Well, I surmised in my master's thesis that there really is a critical period essentially for self-image. And then if that's true, then like you expect an authority figure or you expect an intimate partner to treat you in a different way in accordance to whatever your self-image is. Yeah. And so then you behave in ways that get you what you know, you, you, you create it, right? Like, you know, how, like if someone's insecure and expects to be rejected and you can feel it, yeah. you oftentimes sort of reject them. Like, cause it's annoying. Like they recreate if they, whereas if they expect you to, you know, if someone expects you to treat them with respect and, you know, they're self-confident and they're not overly worried about your perception, then you treat them that way. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that definitely feels true to my experience <laughs> of myself yeah. and, and others. I mean, that, that, that really feels true. And I mean, now what we have now, and we're jumping my head that we didn't have that, is all kinds of neuroscience showing that everything in that human perception and judgment is prediction. And it's prediction based on past experience. So like right now, you don't know it, but if we watched your brain in real time, we could show that you're using the parts of brain associated with your knowledge of language and you're actually anticipating the next word that's going to come out of my mouth based on your knowledge of the subject, your knowledge of English language, and really, most importantly, you're predicting how it's going to make you feel. Yeah. So... Freud, noticing what people were doing, and now we actually have the neuroscience to show like how the perception and judgment, this always predicting based on past experience is not something that was known when I wrote my original master's thesis. Yeah. But it's the mechanism. And, and so you've, you've mentioned perception and judgment a few times. Um, wh why, why do you focus on those? Because I think that's everything. Yeah. Like, the human experience is like we're perceiving the world around us. Yeah. We should be perceiving ourselves, but let's just go with like how people okay. experience <laughs> yeah. life day to day. You're perceiving the world around you. You wake up, you feel groggy, you feel good. You know, you feel hungover, you feel whatever. You know, okay, that's a perception. Then you have a judgment. Oh, I'm going to work out or not work out. I'm going to eat breakfast. I'm going to drink coffee. Like, like life is a series of perceptions and judgment calls. It's all and, is, and is there is there a difference between judgment and decision and making a decision? No, not really. Not, I mean, not in the not in the sense that we're using them right okay. now. Okay. Like yeah. a judgment call is a decision. Okay. You make an assessment and you decide you're going to behave. I mean, behave's a third part. You know, you perceive something, you make some assessment of it, some judgment, and then you, you make act. a decision yeah. about what you're going to do, and you do it. Yeah. Yeah. We just keep cycling through those things. And then the perception is uh, linked to your unconscious then as well. So we think our perception is conscious and we're fully aware. But in reality, what you're saying is there's a layer beneath, which is the unconscious that is often driving that. And so yeah. you, the same two, well, two different people could observe the same scene and perceive it differently. Or you yourself could perceive it differently depending time of day. It could be the same thing. Time of day, or, mood. Or mood. There, there's research, by the way, just since you made that so clear, you did such a good job of that. There was research done, I think it was at Columbia, and this has been like 15 years ago or so, where they set up this scenario that an interviewee was coming in and all the details don't matter, but basically they were handed a hot cup of coffee okay. or, or iced coffee. Like they had this thing where the intern dropped the books and they said, oh, can you hold my coffee? But anyway, the person being interviewed was handed either really hot coffee or really cold coffee. And then afterwards, they were um, asked to assess the interviewer. Okay. And there was a correlation between, you know, was the interviewer warm and friendly and interesting to talk to in hot coffee? Or was the interview rude and interviewer rude and cold and hard to talk to in cold coffee? So the physical experience of hot or cold modify the person's perception somewhat yeah. slight. Yeah. So what kind of mood you're in matters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A long way of agreeing with that. Yeah. And then, then the unconscious 
um, how do you become conscious of your unconscious? How do you become aware of your unconscious? You know what the, the, the gargantuan step one is, is be willing. Like just decide you want to know because many of us have defense mechanisms against really knowing. And so if you're willing to like, it's self-awareness at the end of the day, right? If you're willing to be as self-aware as possible, that, and you want to be, you'll start to become more. Uh, now, there's lots of things you can do and lots of help you can get. But for the general listener, I will just say that. Be willing. Like, okay. Start and, there. And why, why, why would somebody not be willing to look at There's something? things they don't want to see. Okay. Um, there's things they don't want to see about themselves or they don't want to see typically about the family they grew up in. It's usually not so much what they don't want to see in the here and now. I mean, there'll be a repetition in the here and now that is from, that is a repetition of something that happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't want to see what happened to them. So we also like as children, when bad things happen, children are actually narcissistic, right? And so one, one really effective coping mechanism for a child is to believe that something that bad that happened is partly their fault. Now, why that's a, for the child, it gives the child a sense of control. Okay. You know, yeah. Their parents are getting divorced, right? And they have nothing, you know, they're sad and they're scared and they're hurt and they have no control over it. Right. But yeah. if they say, well, they're getting divorced because I was bad, then they can think, well, if I'm good, maybe they'll get back together. Now it's a fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Of course. But it gives the child a sense of agency. So it, it's functional. We're supposed to lose that inaccurate self blame as we become adults yeah. and actually yeah. have agency. Not all people do. And the self criticism, actually ironically functions as giving them a sense of control. Okay. So a hyper self-critical person, while it may sort of hurt them, like, you know, let's say in a professional sense where they're, you know, being too hard on themselves or, you know, too anxious or whatever. Ironically, it's giving them some sense of safety. Okay. So, but it's the kind of thing they're afraid to see because yeah. The self-blame kept them safe originally. So that's a, a, just a good example of how someone, we develop these mechanisms of coping that work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're a little reluctant to lose them because we don't know what will happen with them. Yeah, and and what's, what, what's the benefit then of becoming aware of the unconscious? Oh, you get to be, you get to know who you really are and you get to access all of your capacity or a lot more of your capacity. I mean, you get to, you get to, um, sorry, so the email thing just came across it. Um, like you, you're holding yourself back when you're functioning out of a defense mechanism that was artificially created to give you a sense of control. You really can't access all your intelligence yeah, and yeah. skills and abilities. You know, you don't ever get to become what you're capable of becoming. Yeah, yeah. And and would it would it make your perceptions more accurate? Or is there such thing as an accurate perception or not? Is that yeah, like I think there are more and less accurate perceptions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, here's one that it most a lot of people relate to. You know, people are generally a little bit self-conscious, right? And a little bit self-critical. But the truth is, everybody's a little bit self-conscious and a little bit self-critical. Yeah. So when one person thinks that the other person are think thinking about them and criticizing, they're generally not. They're thinking about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? If, if everybody was realizing that everybody's thinking about themselves and not criticizing them, you know, and how they said that or why they, what they wore or whatever... Like there sort of be less anxiety in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, less it, anxiety. Just take one small social situation. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's it's interesting the way you're talking about the unconscious. You know, because I've over the years I've done a lot of 
you know, uh, self-reflection and work with therapists and so on. And, uh, you know, a, a few things that I've become aware of, you know, one is that, you know, I'm the, there's four children in my family, two old sisters, then me and a uh, brother. But my father used to always say, you're my right-hand man to me. And so I've always had this thing where I always want to be like the advisor, the right-hand man, the trusted other, the trusted lieutenant. And so through my career, I've always kind of, in fact, sort of, consciously or not, I guess unconsciously ended up assuming that role, kind of this like trusted advisory, you know, right-hand man, the guy you can rely on, um, on, on the one hand. Um, and then the other thing I've become aware of is that one of the ways I would get uh, recognition from my parents was through getting good grades academically. And uh, I find that in my job is to make market predictions. So, you know, I think, okay, oil is going to go up or down or stocks are going to go up or down. And if it goes up, I feel great. If it goes down, I feel really bad. It's almost like I'm getting a bad grade. Yeah, totally. And it, it's like no, this well, evaluation. You that are kind getting of, a bad grade. Yeah. It, it kind of like goes back to my kind of self-esteem. Um, yeah. At the same time, rationally, I know markets are at some level just completely random and arbitrary. So why why do I think I can always get this thing right or not? And and you know, and then you end up in these kind of paradoxes. But but certainly, we're listening to you. It, the, these these I you know this this stories about myself come up. You know, and I can quite easily relate to to what you're saying. And when it's all said and done, that's actually why you're talking to me because as I started to talk about the human experience, the real human experience of perception and judgment in markets or careers, people started to relate to it and people started to say, wait a minute, that makes sense to me, just like you just did. And I just, you know, to tag this back to my back, I literally was just in this unusual confluence of circumstances where I was interested in this and didn't let anyone talk me out of it. That was probably... And so I kept pursuing what I see to be more, a more truthful explanation, essentially of why we do what we do, why the humans do yeah. what they do, and, and why they do what they do in the market is like a particular, particularly interesting problem. Um, but why do we do what we do in general? Yeah. And then, so if we bring it to markets, I mean, do you find that there's something about the market that makes people behave differently to other settings, or is it similar to other settings? It's just that there's a certain language we use in markets as a certain sort of domain kind of knowledge you have to have to relate to people or is there something about markets that that makes things of you know changes things a bit in terms of how, how you think about decision making well it, first of all it's the hardest game on the planet you know yeah. it's completely uncertain and it's completely ambiguous it never ends you can't make anything happen so it's totally unlike sports any yeah. sports analogy doesn't apply um and ultimately you're only predicting other people's perception yeah forget that you know we have all these mathematical ways to do it but your objective is to predict how other people are going to value oil next month yeah. or next year or whatever yeah um so people bring their own personality their own social emotional makeup to this thing that is effectively a social emotional game disguised as some sort of probability game um, and that you can use probabilities to play it but it's not the answer. No. It's the clue to the mystery. Yeah. Um, and that's what, you know, I started talking about you have to have emotion to make a decision when I discovered it. What I didn't realize way back then, 2003, was that the Freudian repetition, the self-image expectation, was it going to play itself out vis-a-vis -vis this Rorschach blot, mm -hmm. ink blot of the market. And that people would trade, you know, get bigger or smaller or in early or out early or doubt their judgment, that, then that was just an application of their self-image. Like, so they have their process and their lens, whatever that is, you know, fundamental global map or whatever it is. But it gets applied through their self-image. Yeah. With this implacable authority figure that is never going to pay attention to your personal emotional needs. No. <laughs> and, but you're going to misinterpret its behavior and what you should do through these expectations about like who you are and what you deserve and what the world will give you. 
these kind of fundamental self-image things. Now, there's a second layer to that that you were very clear about just now, where you're literally re-experienced the same experience you had. So, I mean, you're saying, you know, my dad always said you were his right-hand man and you were expected to get good grades. So, like, you provide research to people? That's <laughs> like being their right-hand man, giving them the information and getting the good grades is getting it right. I mean, like, you're literally doing yeah. what you were essentially groomed to do or shaped to do. I had a client last week who's the youngest of four. His next older brother was five years old. And he's like, you know, my biggest problem is I sometimes, I just way too often, I get overwhelmed with the fear of missing out. And so I either don't get out of my position when I should, or I get into early because I just am like literally overwhelmed with it. Well, when you're the younger brother of an, of a brother five years older than you. Your entire childhood experience is missing out. <laughs> okay, yeah. Right? You're two, they're seven. You're four, they're nine. You're eight, they're 13. Your entire childhood experience is you can't keep up with them. Like, so you get into the market in your entire emotional experience, your, your repetition is the same as your past experience. I have thousands of examples of that, but that one was really clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. And and you know what you said earlier about this the ink blot of the market or this this figure sort of judgment sort of figure. Um, it you know I've always had this kind of notion that um, the market is is kind of there to make you humble, you know, because every time you have this kind of you have this winning streak, whether you're a researcher or a trader, whoever, invariably the market will come back to punish you and you'll lose that winning streak. It's just, it's just impossible to be this perfect prediction sort of machine. So right. there's this like constant uh, chipping away at your ego at some sort of level. It's, 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 it's kind of this interplay between the super ego and the ego and uh, or in theological terms, it's, it's like God and, and man. And, you know, you're, you're trying to become a God yourself, but then God reminds you that there's only one God and you're going to be punished and you're going to be, you know, my, my smite will come upon you or something, uh, you know. Um, so so there's all, all of these things I've always felt when I've been, you know, engaged with markets. Uh, it's that, definitely a tick by tick assault on your ego. Yeah. You know, or can be when, when it's not going well. Yeah, it's not right, but it feels as if it is. Yeah, those are great. And and you've mentioned emotion a few times. You know the the link between emotion, decision making, or emotion rationality. Um, and you know, as you said, the science is is fairly clear on this, but it it's, doesn't seem to make intuitive sense. It's almost like emotions get in the way of your rationality. You know, it's almost like the ideal rational machine is is someone who's extremely autistic or who's like a robot who doesn't have any emotions. I mean, how, how, how do you kind of reconcile the, the link between emo emotion and rationality? Well, I think the latest neuroscience says there is no separation, that the, all, the okay. way to be most rational is to understand the actual data set of your feelings and emotions. Okay. Now, let me say a couple of things. You know, there is some research that showed that uh, I don't exactly remember if it was if it was exactly on the spectrum, but it it was a group of people who had, you know, perception and judgment that was devoid of normal emotion. OK. And they did have some success. Um, so there is that. So there's that. I'm going to say a couple of different things and then we'll try to pull them back together. The other, there's like a wild misunderstanding. It's not the emotion that causes the problem. It's the decision, right? It's the choice. Yes. So it's like really not control your emotions. It's control your choices. Like control your behavior. Like there's a literal a logical fallacy there. Which, yep. by the way, when I first started trading, I couldn't understand it. The guy in the office who made the most money, who traded a risk R strategy, which was, of course, to me as a brand new trader, damn complicated. He was also by far the most emotional. Jumping up and down, screaming, mm -hmm. 
this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, and he printed money, like in this complicated strategy. And I was always like, take the emotion out of it, Steve. This <laughs> doesn't add up. But in any event, um, so we think we make decisions based on our analysis. Yeah. We think we make decisions based on, you know, how we've learned to understand the market. And then we do this analysis and we make this prediction. That's actually not what we make the decision on. We make the decision on our confidence in that analysis. And if we don't, for example, have, con like if you are three quarters of the way through an analysis and you think you know the answer, you probably, for the most part, don't stop or you do a little bit more work. Because why? You want to develop more confidence in yeah. the thing you're saying. So your answer drops out of whatever your lens is about the market. And then you have a feeling about the viability of that answer. Yeah, yeah. And it's that feeling that caused you to do something. It's that feeling that it caused you to recommend. It's yeah. the lack of that feeling or the opposite, let's say, and concern, doubt, anxiety, fear, panic, that might cause you to hold back and go get some more information. In the hedge fund world, we will call that feeling conviction. Yeah, you know? yeah. How much do we believe, which basically what is it? How much do we believe our analysis? Yeah. So that's what matters. And I could, if I had my slide set in front of you, I literally can give you a hundred quotes from science in the last 20 years showing, saying how emotion is the clue to being rational. Emotion is the clue to good decisions. Emotions are required for complete analysis. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And it really is just this logical fallacy that emotions are conflated with behavior. Like if you feel something, you have to do it. No, yeah. you don't. You get this energy that kind of urges you to do something, usually. And that's, they really mean control the urge. Yeah. <laughs> don't act impulsively. And what we now know is that there's an enormous amount of information in our senses, feelings, and emotions, which are only degrees of intensity of the same physical experience. You get knowledge out of your body, a sense, a feeling, an emotion, some information in a sense, feeling, and emotion. The trick is to learn to see that as a data set and to actually analyze it in an organized way, which can be done once you understand how that system's working. So it's just, I mean, the original guy whose science I, I discovered in 2003 was Antonio Damasio, who wrote a book called Descartes' Air. And it was you know, Descartes the philosopher said, I think, therefore I am. Yeah. Damasio wrote this book to said, no, it's I feel, therefore I am. And in the interim 20 years, I mean, the amount of research that's gone into emotion, judgment, decision-making, like there were 50 papers in 2000, 5,000 papers in 2005, 5,000 papers in 2010. I recently found a chart that showed the increased dollar amount that's gone to the study of emotion in the past 20 years. I mean, it's jaw dropping. We literally mm -hmm. just didn't know. We just didn't know. We just mis misunderstand our own mechanism of perception and judgment. Yeah. No, that's great. And Didn't you ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and, and then how does one go about understanding one's emotion or recognizing emotions. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, it, it's, it, it needs to be like a presumably vocabulary. You need to have some kind of awareness of what to look for or, you know, how, yeah. how do you go about instructing people? Right? Well, again, I'm going to say first is be willing. Um, yeah. There is research that shows that vocabulary makes a huge difference. Okay. And so, like, I start out workshops uh, and I'm going to do one for Real Vision next week where I literally have people write down Every word they can think of for a feeling or emotion of trading and investing. See okay. how many there are. Because the research shows that the more words you have for these physical experiences, the more you can get the information out of them. And the more you're likely to 
not act impulsively. Okay, yeah. So I always summarize this into the question of what am I feeling and why? It's an easy question to ask. It's an, you know, you basically know what I mean when I say what am I feeling and why? Yeah. Answering it accurately, though, <laughs> is like a whole other skill set. And the value of answering it accurately is almost indescribable, both in a general perception and judgment, but particularly in a market perception and judgment. So you have to undertake the process of learning how to build your dictionary on yourself that helps you accurately answer, what am I feeling and why? So... Like I'll start with people with all these words and then I'll kind of boil it down to the words related to conviction or confidence. And I help people build like spectrums so that they have a tool that they can kind of figure out on a daily. Okay, it, a daily or last week I had a client who literally sent me his fundamental process. And for each data point in his fundamental process, he had ranked his level of belief according to this cult list of feelings around confidence. Okay. Um, because what you end up being able to do is pull out your true intuition, you know, your actual expertise, because expertise starts to exist as a feeling. You know, it starts out as this linear conscious thing, and the better you get at something, the more it goes into your body. The more you know what you're feeling and why, you get to start to pull out your true pattern recognition based on all your years in the market and separate that from whatever the self-image reputation is or expectation is. repetition was the word I really meant. Self-image repetition. So you start to know, you know what? My sense of these four things that are going to happen with oil in the next four months, like I'm really convicted. I mean, I'm convicted in three of them. One I'm not so sure about. I could maybe get more information. Okay, you got that. You got that feeling. Then you also have the feeling of, you know, but I do have to get an A and I do need to be right. And that's some sort of anxiety, right? Well, you start to be able to untangle that. So you can just tolerate the anxiety of, you know, being pressured to get an A and believe the intuition of, that's your expertise. And you know kind of which feeling is which. It's like learning the new sport, I admit. You know, it's like picking up a golf club or putting on a set of skis the first time. It's not, you know, you're not going to do it just right. I mean, it's going to take effort, you know, mental and physical effort. But it works. It works. People are able to separate their integral versus their incidental. So there's a woman in Harvard, Jennifer Lerner, who's done a lot of research in risk and emotion. And she categorizes all of our emotions as integral you know, meaning they matter to the situation or incidental, meaning they don't. I think in investing, you can summarize that as informational or irrelevant, intuition, true pattern recognition, or impulse. And it's a, people can do it. And, and here's the really amazing thing about it. Because you're starting to work with your own human perception and judgment like more the way it actually works, it actually starts to get easier. You're not fighting yourself. Okay, yeah. As much. You're not having to say, follow my process, follow my process. Listen, don't listen to the fact that I like, there's a little voice telling me, because this is what always happens, right? Follow the process, follow the process. Don't listen to that little voice. Six months later, I knew it. I should have listened to the voice. But there was no point in your process that you could listen to the voice because you're not allowed to. Hmm. But if you start doing this from the much more accurate, understanding now perception judgment decision making you can put a part in your process for the voice and then you can undertake skill development to analyze the voice and you're not going to get it right 100 percent of the time but you're going to get it right more of the time than you did before you were doing that and so is, is there certain from a practical perspective then i mean do you are there certain ways people can bring this into their process or their routines? I mean, is it you journal every at the end of each day? Is it when you feel imbalanced in some way at that point, you, you, you start to write down, you know, what you think your, your feeling is and, and, and kind of the, you know, what it's, it's, it's linked to and separating the impulse from the intuition. I mean, how, how, how do you, 
I mean, how do you sort of guide putting people? Feel- this? Yeah. Putting feelings into words, whether it's you, you know, in a computer screen or you in a piece of paper or you and another person, like, is this the feeling? Why is that the feeling? No, it's really kind of this feeling. Okay, where did that come from? Well, it's really kind of this feeling based on that. Like, untangling the spaghetti bowl of that subjective experience via language, you know, in an ideal world, probably with someone who knows how to talk to you about it. But since there aren't even enough people in the world to provide that service to everybody, like, you can do it, someone for yourself, through journaling or through just writing. Or if you're really lucky, if you have like, you know, a person who gets it that you can actually talk to, what I mean is gets the value of you sorting through what you really feel. Because most of us in this world of cognition is superior and, you know, you shouldn't be anxious or worried or not confident or whatever. It's hard to find people who can listen to someone talk through their concern or worry or doubt without judging the concern, worry or doubt without yeah. like trying to emphasize the, the analytical piece of it. And what happens is when someone can, whether you do it for yourself typing, and there is research by the way, that like even with athletes and if they make a mistake, that they process the mistake and recover from it more quickly if they write about it, hmm. which is a little bit ironic also in a positive thinking world because it's supposed to be shake it off, be confident, be positive, blah, 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 blah. Um, Everybody knows that stuff and everybody knows that like it only sort of doesn't work, but then they don't want to tell anybody it doesn't work because then they feel more like something's wrong with me. I digress, as usual. Um, words, you were right. Words. That's actually the, called emotion differentiation and emotion granularity. So differentiation is like knowing the difference between fear, frustration, and disappointment, let's say. And okay. granularity is knowing, okay, how many different kinds of fear are there? How many different kinds of frustration are there? How many different kinds of disappointment? Just fear and frustration are a lot easier than disappointment. Disappointment's hard to get super granular with. But I mean, like fear, you can be like mildly concerned or you can be terrified. You know, frustrated, you could be, you know, annoyed or like enraged. (laughs) Right? Like there's, it's granular. So there's research that shows that the more granular a portfolio manager is with their negative emotion the more money they make in well-analyzed situations. You know, they did the work, but they could be granular, like, and they have an expectation. They have some information. They could be granular about why they're worried about it. The person who's able to do that is going to be able to execute better on their analysis than the person who doesn't. And, And, you know, how important is your body in all of this? It's huge because, I mean, literally in a, re- in a research institution, this is called visceral intelligence. You know, okay. visceral is referring yeah. to your viscera in your body. Like the information is there. I, I was talking to some quants, very mathematical, a few weeks ago. And, you know, we're definitely talking about like their, their educated ability to choose, you know, a model or an algorithm. And I'm like, look, let's suppose I had some new complicated problem and I explained the problem to you knowing that you're going to apply math to the problem in a way that I, Denise Shell, couldn't do. But knowing you, you're an expert. What's the first thing that you're going to do? You're going to think to yourself, such and such, whatever, drawn from calculus is like the way to think about this. And how you can feel. And they're like, so you're going to have a sense of what the right math is to apply. And they're like, well, yeah, of course. I'm like, you're going to have a sense, a bodily reaction as to the appropriate math to apply to whatever this problem is. That's like an intuition. That's a bodily piece of information. And even though you're a math guy, and even though you're a telequant guy, and you think you don't use that stuff at all, presented with a new problem, you have a physical bodily sense of what's the right thing to do. That's expertise. And that's where it exists, in your body. And are there certain parts of your body that, you know, those emotions show up first? Is it like your, your stomach, would you say, or, you know, uh, your shoulders or something? Or does it just vary too much between people? I, I, yeah, I, 
there probably is some research around that, um, but I don't know it. And I don't, I think it's kind of more individualized. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm going to say something tangential that is there's actually research that shows um, the more you can detect your own heart rate, just like sitting here and you feel yeah. the heartbeat, yeah. that's called interoception, meaning you can perceive your internals. And it's the basis of sense, feeling, and emotion. It's like awareness of your body. So while I don't necessarily think, you know, like I hold tension right here, you know, but, and again, a lot of us hold tension right there. That's what, you know, get shoulder massages. But I think it, I, I don't think we really know for sure. But I wanted to mention the heart rate thing because I think it's, the converse is true. You can practice just trying to hear your heart rate until so you can start to practice knowing a little bit more of what you're sensing and feeling. And again, then you're willing, you're dropping some of the defenses and you start to learn to trust yourself. You start to find out that that little voice is often right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, w one thing I found, um, I'm not sure if there's any research or you found this as well, is um, uh, it, when I think about my breathing, you might, my breath kind of reveals a lot about how I'm feeling. So yeah. in my case, you know, I might hold my breath when I'm tense. And then yeah. as soon as I become aware of that, I know okay, I'm holding something. And so I need to look, look into what that is. And my breathing pattern, if I'm, my out breath is very shallow versus my in breath or, or yeah, things like that, which I guess are related to the heart rate. But I find breathing, sort of the, the breathing side is, uh, is something I use at least personally. It's been a useful indicator of my sort of feelings. Yeah, I mean, I just, I'll say it again, like anybody can think about any realm and when they first learn to do that thing that now they're somewhat of an expert in, you know, I don't yeah. care if it's research or math or skiing or golf or whatever, like you first learned it like step by step, you know, you were introduced yeah. to it, it made some sense, you you know, amalgamated it in your head and like then you became really knowledgeable in it and at which point you didn't do it consciously linearly you did it out of a sense yeah and we all want we can all be better in whatever our craft is by learning how to navigate and interpret those senses better than we were taught particularly given that we were taught to ignore them yeah. and there's still enormous amounts of information in finance and behavioral finance like your intuition is useless it's crazy <laughs> And I mean, what, what, I mean, what, one thing that does sort of stand out is at least the cultural image of successful traders or hedge fund managers seem to be these, uh, I, it's hard to imagine them being very self-aware. They seem to be these kind of very macho type sort of people. I mean, that's, that's the cultural representation of them. Now, obviously you've worked with lots of very successful traders and I mean, do you find that they they are that self-aware and they have that willingness to look inside of themselves? Well, first of all, people who call me by definition have some level of willingness, right? Or they wouldn't call. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I yeah. do have a, you know, there's a selection a select. Bias. So my data set is skewed. But there's a couple of things. Um, real brain research shows that those who are best at predicting markets are predicting other people and they're using more people prediction and social skills. Okay, yeah. So... Because why, you know, all that matters is what everyone else is going to think down the road. And if you're, whatever factors you analyze is to get to that answer. So some of people who are really talented in markets, like have that innately. People prediction. If you think about studying economics, it's largely about like, how are the groups going to react? And then what are the, you know, what are the, and certain people were either born with more, it's called theory of mind, born with more theory of mind or use more theory of mind. Um, and then they also might be fairly good at knowing when they're confident or not confident. Knowing, like, despite what people tell them, trusting their intuition. They might not be completely self-aware as to the moments that they get, like, afraid of future regret and double down on a position and, you know, blow a month's worth of work. And they could get better by knowing that level of, but they might come to the job with greater theory of mind and, and natural sort of 
conviction, intuition, trust, and skill, if you will. And so they might laugh, like the complete level of, to use the Olympic athlete I work with, she uses the term mental awareness. They might not have the complete mental awareness, but I, like, there isn't anyone that I could not listen to if they describe their market process. And they may be describing their market process as like complete devoid of emotion and be completely process driven. And I'd be able to go there, 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 and there. There was something discretionary, something that you basically made a decision on some sort of confidence spectrum. Or we'll use the word instincts. Some of our instincts are okay, but intuition is bad. Like, <laughs> but having said that, like any, you know, everybody's got their pattern, right? Like, I'm sorry, everybody gets too big, too quick, too small, too fast, in too early out. You know, everybody in the market's got some version. Of that. I don't care how successful you are. You want to solve that? Get to know what you're really feeling and why. Because there's a unconscious emotional driver for why you get too big too quick or in too early or out too early or whatever it is. Or why you double down at the worst possible moments or why you give up on a position right before it works. There's a past emotional narrative that you experienced, that you are unconsciously applying to your perception, judgment in the market. And those things, if someone's willing, can be found and can be untangled. Maybe not solved 100% sometime, but untangled such that you're not controlled by this thing you don't understand that seems like you just have to control the emotion. You just have to control yourself and follow the process. Okay. Yeah. So, so I hear you there. So, so people may come to you, you know, they might sort of say, look, I can't handle losses or I'm getting to position too early, too late or whatever the, the, the reason is they come ultimately the, the path for them to, you know, improve is to have this recognition of how the unconscious, their past, how that's affecting their emotions and their perception and hence their, their judgment and, and, uh, and their actions thereafter. I think that's the biggest lever. Yeah. I think someone can um, start to be more organized about intuition and like more okay with using intuition and kind of recognizing it and ranking it and get better about recognizing and ranking conviction. You know, what that's really like, what do I really think and how much do I believe it? Before they get into their unconscious, like in doing those two pieces will help. Yeah. Because yeah. they're honoring that, that piece of the judgment decision. But if they really want to be the best they can be, or they really want to solve a, a pattern that they see, like, let's go deeper into, I mean, fear of missing out kind of everybody has, but it's really future regret if you really unpack it. And then what's that regret about and where's it coming from? And then that's where you start to get into what does it mean to be person? Yeah. And, you know, you've obviously been doing this for, for a number of years now. Uh, uh, you know, how, how have you changed your approach um, over that period of time? You know, I've refined it. Okay. I mean, a couple of things have happened. I've had way more science to build on. Yeah. So I literally didn't have this, you know, we're always predicting and we're particularly predicting a future emotion. It's called anticipatory affect. And the guy that's done the most work is Brian Newton at Stanford. But like now I can say to somebody with, you know, like sunrises in the East kind of certainty, there's a future emotion being predicted in this situation. Let's figure out what it is. Hmm. Now I knew that from the psychoanalyst but I couldn't be quite as declarative about it as I can be now. So I can, ex like I used to think of it completely as a, well, maybe not completely, but largely as a psychoanalyst would think of it. Now I can do the whole job, but almost without even bringing the psychoanalyst into it. Cause the science says we're always predicting based on past experience. The science says that, like the cutting edge of neuroscience says that. So that's all I have to say. I don't have to bring 
Freud, or more importantly, the modern psychoanalyst, which is actually my angle on it. Okay. And, you know, I know you've, you've consulted on the show billions and, um, you know, you're, you're, you know, you, um, you, you kind of uh, associated with that, but for me, the interesting thing about that, uh, idea is that the hedge fund has uh, a coach or therapist within the, the, the hedge fund sort of setup. Um, so leaving that, the specifics of that aside, if you were to sort of set up a hedge fund and you were, you know, you wanted to create the right culture, you know, to to manifest, you know, what we've been talking about. I mean, how would you set the the fund up? I mean, what what types of things would you try to do to make sure that it would be the right environment for this? The first thing I would do is make people's physical health an absolute priority. Meaning, this aura ring. I don't know if you've heard. Of oh aura yeah, ring. yeah, I can see that. Yes, yeah. your ring helps um, um, measure your sleep. Yeah. yeah. Literally, no one will ever do this, but the hedge fund that has a really nice nap room that allows people to take a nap without any cultural, you know, (laughs) pushback, we'll make more money, period. Sleep deprived skews our judgment. When we are sleep deprived, we misperceive risk. So... Not being sleep deprived means we would more accurately foresee risk. And what would be the result of a whole hedge fund more accurately perceiving risk? Not overemphasizing it and not in it. Like they would make more money. (laughs) Yeah. But people put nap rooms in. I worked in a hedge fund for three years at a nap room. It became a storage room. It was full of boxes. Hmm. But you can't actually go in there and take a nap. And it'd be okay. So that would be my first. Because you decide on conviction. It's a physical experience. You need to know what it is. That physical experience is, is informed by your literal physical experience, by your actual <laughs> bodily energy. So let's optimize the bodily energy. Your perception of judgment will be better. It's as simple as that. Now, I mean, I, of course, would do all of the things that I do in terms of building conviction spectrums and getting people to, you know, pitch their stocks or pitch their ideas or pitch their, you know, position expansion or contraction vis-a-vis the lens of conviction. You know, I would be a global macro momentum kind of person if I had my own hedge fund because that's more of my background. But I would just get the whole psychological capital right. And actually, if we go back to my book, speaking of my process not being terribly different, because sometimes I'll pick up my book and go, wow, I said that 12 years ago. (laughs) Um, But in there, I have a hedge fund. And in there, the hedge fund prioritizes psychological capital. That's what I would do. I mean, obviously, I get people who know what they're doing. And, you know, you got to know how to hit the ball. You got to know the basics of playing the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people sometimes will mistake what I say for saying, you can just do what I say. And make money in the market. I'm never saying that. I'm saying you have the basic idea of how, you know, you have some way to play the game, whether it's fundamental or technical or global macro or whatever. But it's a joint, your results are a joint probability of the accuracy of your lens for the market and your ability to execute it. There's a ton of things we can do to get closer to optimizing our ability to execute on our expertise that we don't do or most people don't do. Yeah. Yep. That all makes, makes a lot of sense. I don't think I've ever worked in a place that has a a nap room. I I did work at one place that did have a kind of meditation room. And so people would use that to meditate or pray or, or or whatever. But then um, I, I went, there once to have a look at what was happening there. And I noticed there were two, three people sleeping on the floor. They were using it as a, as a nap room, interestingly yeah. enough, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is interesting. Um, but I absolutely, you know, what you say about sleep, I think is, 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 is very, very true. And I, uh, I didn't, you know, some of that research again is Jennifer Lerner out of Harvard, which last I knew she was consulting the Navy. She'd taken like a leave of absence. She's done some insane work showing how, like, 
sleep deprived skews your risk perception. You literally don't see it. So, you know, you know those times where you look back and you go, how did I miss that? What was I thinking? I used to ask my clients if they've showed up with a, oh my God, yesterday I like totally blew it. I don't know what I was thinking. I'll be like, you know, how much sleep did you get? And half the time they'd say, well, the new baby was awake and my wife was sick. And, you know, like sure enough, you know, not to dilute the complexity of my job <laughs> to sleep, but it's a important factor. <laughs> it's an important factor. Yeah. Now, you know, it's the athlete. It's the athlete. You know, the football player has his expertise. And then he has how much energy does he have to play the game? Like, we don't question it in athletics. We don't question sleep and diet, you know, in athletics. Because we know the expertise is delivered through the body. We misunderstand how much of our market expertise is delivered through the body. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, you know speaking to a few kind of almost non-market related questions have come to my mind. You know, one is, what do you make of midlife crises that people often have, well, men in particular in finance that, uh, that you know, you know, is, is, is it, is there such a thing or is it, is it, is it kind of, oh, uh, there's definitely such thing. and, and why, why does it happen? I, you often see it and it's, um, I'm not sure if it's more prevalent in finance or not, but you know, you, you see a lot of it. I was talking to a new client on Monday, person's 52, kids are grown, they've made a ton of money. And they're sort of like, I don't care about money. Like, I like the game. Yeah. I like the intellectual, you know, pursuit of the answer. But I don't actually care about the money. Like, so what should I do now? Like, and we figured out they, they were okay caring about the money while they had kids to raise and put through college. Like, you know, okay, I want to give my kids a nice life, right? So... I'm, I'm going to go make this money. Now that that's all done, they're like, I got enough money, I don't care. So that one you'll have to get back to me because we'll just see what happens with that person. <laughs> um, I probably haven't, I have a stunning number of clients who are men between like 38 and 45 with three children. Okay. <laughs> like the next time, I, I just got a new client a few weeks ago who was in that category, 40, and wife was pregnant with the fourth. And I was like, wow, somebody has four kids. Mm -hmm. So my point is, most of my clients are sort of pre-midlife, right? So, <laughs> okay. So I don't know how much more intelligence I can have. Yeah. And, and then the other one is, um, we just had the Oscars recently, and there was something happened during the Oscars. You know, Will Smith uh, heard yeah, a yeah. from Chris Rock and went on stage and, uh, you know, struck uh, Chris Rock. I mean, what do you make of that? You know, Will Smith is Mr. You know, down to earth, you know, super composed. And, and he did that. What, what? I haven't thought about it that much, to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, first I was like, was it real? Yeah. So I guess I think it was real, but I got to tell you, my, my intuition still isn't sure it was real. Despite the subsequent apology and just—I just—I don't know. I've but seen lots of videos. I've, I've seen lots of videos where experts have slowed the video down, and apparently, it's 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 like an actor's type of slap. You know, where where there's like a, it looks like a slap. They may not be a slap or something. You know, so well, they are actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's suppose it were real. Yeah. It's bizarre because, first of all, these comedians say, you know, insulting, offensive jokes all the time. Yeah. Now, a man for his wife. Maybe. Maybe. It really becomes about him, which is a problem, not about her. You know, and is it, if it was real, first of all, it's just not acceptable. Like, but I think it's like a reflection of our culture where like you're allowed to act out anger now with, you know, impunity yeah. more. And then as a woman, you get into the whole, well, how about she defend herself? 
But so I don't really know what I think other than I'm not even sure it's real. Still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my intuition. You know, like if it were gun to my head, bet I'd have to go with not real because I have learned to trust that voice. Yeah. I could be wrong. But yeah. Well, I guess we'll find out, uh, you know, at some point it'll Maybe. come out. And when they probably, they're probably going to co-present the Oscars next year together as best friends or something. Um, okay, now, uh, uh, I did want to ask a few sort of personal questions. You know, one was, um, what's the best investment advice you've ever received? I saw that on the list. I don't, I, <laughs> oh no. Um, I, I, by lone self, I literally don't know. The truth is, ah, I don't okay. Know. Okay, interesting. And then um, more importantly, you know, do you have a kind of a system or some kind of uh, productivity approach uh, to kind of keep on top of everything? Because obviously, you know, there's a lot of academic literature that's coming out in your area. I mean, you're managing lots of clients. I mean, you know, you're managing a business as well. I mean, how, how you know, how do you do it all? Um, I'm not particularly into astrology, but I am a Virgo and I'm by nature very organized. Okay. And so like, a to-do list that works and for us it has now finally after years and years and years and years and years become uh microsoft teams they have a tasks thing yeah and i am finally happy with my to-do list in tasks in teams even though it's microsoft and it's clunky the other thing you know is put things on the calendar so like, you know, I'll know that as the business owner, you know, I got to deal with the taxes or the insurance or like, you know, the fact that there was some weird $800 charge on my credit card that like, and you know, those are the kind of things that can disrupt you and you waste a bunch of time and like you get distracted and you don't get your the most important stuff done. Because that's the flip side. You know, what's everything you have to get done and what are the most important things? And so yeah. put most of your energy into the most important things. But there are real things like taxes and bringing insurance and all that stuff you have to take care of. Put it on the calendar. You know, next week I'm going to spend 90 minutes with my assistant and we're going to go over every one of these tedious paperwork, financial, <laughs> business running things. And then you do it. Then you don't worry about it when something comes across your desk. And then you do focus on it. Yeah. Put it on a calendar. I mean, I even put remember to call. Oh, yeah. Know, like in a 15 minute thing on my calendar. And then I do actually remember to call because I put the phone number right there. And so comprehensive to-do lists that work for you. And there's a thousand kinds, right? You know, Monday.com. I mean, there's a million of them. My clients are always talking to me about them. But for us now, tasks by team, by Microsoft, and putting things on the calendar. That sounds good. And, and priorities. Priorities, Priorities, yeah, absolutely. And, and then books. Um, are there certain books that have really influenced you? Or perhaps books well, recently that you think have been very good? Well, I, I'll tell you a great one. It didn't so much influence me, but I sort of knew, but it crystallized. It's called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain by Lisa Feldman Barrett. It's short, and it basically tells you what I told you. You're always predicting everything. Um, the Drama of the Gifted Child, which is a long, complicated, dense, intense, overwhelming book written, I think, in the 1980s. Yeah. But it really does if you can wade your way through it, and I've had plenty of clients who've waded their way through it, mm -hmm. it does help you see how like you have this experience as a child and it caused you to think certain ways about yourself. And maybe they're true or not true. Chances are they're not true, right? Like the, the things happened that caused you to think certain things that maybe were irrelevant. Yeah, no, 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 great, great recommendations there. And then finally, you know, if people wanted to follow you, you know, get in touch with you, um, see you, what was the best way, way, way to do this uh, for them to do that? So my consulting company is called the Rethink Group. The Rethink Group, it's really Rethink Thinking, that yeah. whole metacognition we said. It's rethinkgroup.net. Okay, I'll make sure to include the link on the show notes as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm on Twitter as Denise, my middle initial K, Shull. Um, I've got interviews on Real Vision and various other places. And I think that's basically it. Through the website. The best way, if someone wants to actually contact us, 
Yeah. Like send a note through the website because it turns out it's the only way we manage. Yeah. And then your name goes into that tasks on teams. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, don't the, forget about you. Yeah. We, we've seen, uh, yeah, you've described how the sausage is made. So that's good. Good to know. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, that was a that was a really eye opening and and such a a great experience speaking to you. And I feel as though we could speak for much, much, much longer. And but I'm cognizant that I have to respect your your time. Um, but at least from my side, it was is fantastic speaking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Fun to speak to you too. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.